All right, everyone, welcome back. We are now at chapter 12, looking at the central nervous system. Specifically, we're gonna be looking at the brain. We might mention the spine a little bit at the end, but really the brain is the focus of this chapter. And the rest of this semester, the rest of this unit, is going to be focused on the nervous system. This chapter, looking at some of the structures of the brain and what their functions are. And then the next lecture, we'll be looking at a couple of chapters uh, regarding the peripheral nervous system. So both this lecture and the next lecture, if you look at the chapters, they're pretty extensive. We are not going to be covering all of chapter 12 here, and we will not be covering all of chapters 13 and 14 in the next lecture. We're really going to cut it way back and only look at the parts that we discuss here in these lectures. But as always, we will start with our not really attendance questions for the day. First, in most homeostatic feedback loops, what part of the body is responsible for integration? And next, what neurotransmitter is used in the motor division of the peripheral nervous system? So go ahead and try to answer those. And let's see what the answer to them actually are. In most homeostatic feedback loops, what part of the body is responsible for integration? Remember, integration is where we receive the, the input and make some sort of decision as to what to do about it. And in most, not all, but in most homeostatic feedback loops, this is accomplished by the brain. Next, what neurotransmitter is used in the motor division of the peripheral nervous system? So this is what we were just talking about in the previous chapter on muscles. So we're going to be using ACH, acetylcholine. All right, what we're really going to be talking about in this chapter is the brain. Now, keep in mind that the spine is also part of the central nervous system. We may mention it a little bit in our lecture today, but most of what we're going to be talking about is the brain. And when we talk about the brain, there are different parts, different divisions of the brain, many of which you're going to be learning in lab. Um, so what we want to talk about first is the cerebrum. Now, the cerebrum is, if, if I were to ask you to picture a brain, well, most of what comes to mind when you think about the brain is the cerebrum. And that's what we see in this picture here. That's the cerebrum. Now, the cerebrum is actually divided into a left and right portion, and each of those portions is called a cerebral hemisphere. So you have a left and right cerebral hemisphere that makes up the cerebrum. And when we look at the cerebrum, the outer portion of it, the outer maybe two to four millimeters, which is about an eighth of an inch, that outer bit is called the cerebral cortex. And that's what we're going to look at right now. The cerebral cortex is where your conscious mind is. Anything that you choose to do, that you think about, that you understand, that's your cerebral cortex at work. And when we're talking about the cerebral cortex, different parts of it are going to have different functions. Well, some of the cerebral cortex is devoted to, we call it the motor area. And in your picture here, the motor area is this black region right here. Now, motor areas are what cause you to move things that you consciously move. When you decide to move your hands to write notes, you're using your motor area. When you get up to go get a bite to eat, those are your motor areas that are at work. Anything that you consciously move is your motor area working. Next, the sensory areas, well, in your brain drawing here, the red portion are your sensory areas. Sensory areas are what 
receive information from your various senses. Um, things like smell, sight, touch, taste. There are lots of senses. Um, a lot of sources will say you have five senses. Uh, well, that's not really true. There are many, many senses uh, that all go into your sensory areas. And one of the tougher things to kind of wrap your head around is when your information comes in to your sensory areas, at this point, it does not mean anything at all. At this point, it is just an electrical signal, action potentials, arriving at your brain. So let's use sight as an example. When light hits your eyes, there's a structure inside called the retina. When light hits your retina, that triggers action potentials that travel along the optic nerve to a sensory area in your brain. And at this point, that's all that it is, information arriving at your brain in the form of electricity. It does not tell you what you are seeing, only that light has hit your retina and you're seeing something. Which brings us to the next part, the association areas. The association areas are all of the white, the unshaded portion of the brain here. The association areas give meaning to whatever came in to the sensory areas. So when that light arrives at your uh, eye and the electrical signal is sent to the sensory area of your brain, we said it doesn't mean anything. Well, from the sensory areas, it's passed to the association areas. And in the association areas, it's going to compare it to pretty much all of your life history. When you look at your wall and you see a light switch, that signal is sent to your brain to the sensory areas, and it doesn't mean anything. The sensory area then sends that information to the association area, and you, without thinking about it, are comparing what you're looking at to things that you have seen before, and your brain decides, oh, okay, that's a light switch. That's the association area at work. When you smell something, it goes to your sensory areas, doesn't mean anything. That smell is sent to association areas, and now it's compared to previous smells that you've encountered. Oh, that's a hamburger cooking. So the motor areas move things voluntarily. Sensory areas receive information from your various sensory organs. Association areas give meaning to whatever has come in to the sensory areas. On this slide, we see some of the many regions that are found in the motor areas of the cerebral cortex. So let's talk about some of the more common ones that you'll hear about. Uh, the first is the primary motor cortex. Now, the primary motor cortex is responsible for precise, skilled movements. Uh, earlier, I mentioned if you are writing notes, all right, you're using your primary motor cortex. If you play a musical instrument, the way you're moving your fingers is precise, skilled movements. We'll come back to playing an instrument a little later on, but as far as the actual movement of your fingers, primary motor cortex is directing those very skilled, precise movements. The premotor cortex is kind of tied to the primary motor cortex in that any sort of movements that are planned out, that happens in the premotor cortex. And this is kind of subconsciously, you're not actually thinking, well, what do I want to do with my hands right now? No, this is just before a movement occurs, your brain is planning those movements and that is the premotor cortex that's responsible for that. Next, two different areas that are associated with speech. The first is Broca's area. Broca's area is responsible for production and planning of speech. 
Now, when we're talking about production of speech, this is things like the muscles that are involved in producing words. And this is also going to be tied into things like sign language. Even if you're not verbally speaking, if you're, if you're signing, well, that's still Broca's area going into that production and planning of speech. Wernicke's area is responsible for understanding language. So when someone's speaking to you and you're understanding what they're saying, that's Wernicke's area that's at work. And it's also responsible for putting words together in a way that actually forms a coherent sentence. These two areas are something that can be used diagnostically to see what part of a brain has been damaged due to a stroke. Uh, sometimes if someone has a stroke, maybe it'll affect Broca's area, in which case you can talk to them and they can understand you but they can't verbalize, they can't produce words, they've lost the ability to speak. In Wernicke's area, it manifests really differently. If Wernicke's area is damaged by a stroke, well, this patient can still produce speech. They're saying real words in whatever language they speak, but those words are put together kind of nonsense. You'll often hear the term word salad. Here they're saying real words, but they are in no sort of order that makes any sense at all. So that's one of the ways that we can kind of determine was one of these areas damaged by a stroke, by can they produce speech? And if they do, does that speech make sense? The interesting thing about strokes is most of the time the brain can recover if it's not too, too extensive. The brain has something called plasticity. And plasticity means that if one area of the brain is damaged, well, that damage typically is forever. Remember, neurons don't regenerate. Well, what can actually happen is a different part of the brain can pick up that same job given enough time for that to happen. So if you wipe out Broca's area and the patient can't speak any longer, there's still a pretty good chance that given enough time, another part of the brain will take over for what Broca's area normally does. Next up, we're going to look at how some of our senses work. And remember, we have many, many senses, and we saw at the beginning that when information first arrives at your brain from one of your sensory organs, it doesn't mean anything. So we're going to see how that information arrives at your brain and then how meaning is given to it. The primary somatosensory cortex is that area that we have all of this information coming in about our surroundings. Um, and at this point, it doesn't mean anything. It's just from various sources, touch, hearing, smell, all of that, all of this information coming in to your brain. And from that primary somatosensory cortex, which has a lot of areas we'll see in just a little bit, that information is passed on to the somatosensory association cortex. And here, information is given meaning. Uh, we're going to compare it to things that we've encountered before to actually give meaning to what it was that came into the primary somatosensory cortex. So first, in the primary somatosensory cortex, we will have the primary visual cortex. The primary visual cortex is where information coming in from your eyes arrives. At this point, it doesn't mean anything to your brain at all. Keep that in mind. That's going to be a running trend. When information comes into your primary visual cortex, that signal is then passed to your visual association area where your brain compares that to anything that you've seen before so that your brain can then decide, okay, that's an elephant or that's a car or that's a hamburger. 
So it's the primary visual cortex that receives stimuli from your eyes. It's your visual association area where you actually know what it is that you're seeing. The same layout occurs to information that comes in through your ears. The primary auditory cortex receives information from your ears about whatever sound you just heard. Once it arrives at the auditory cord of the primary auditory cortex, that information is then passed to the auditory association area where it's compared to things that you've heard before and it is given meaning. So when a car honks its horn, that information first goes to your auditory cortex and doesn't mean anything. Then it's sent to the auditory association area where your brain says, that's a car horn. The vestibular cortex is your awareness of balance. This is one of those senses that I said falls outside of those five that we typically hear about. Well, sense of balance is an actual sense and your vestibular cortex is your awareness of balance. It gives you an idea of the position of your body and are you balanced. The olfactory cortex is your awareness of odor, smells. The gustatory cortex, that's your perception of taste. When you eat food, your gustatory cortex is what's actually playing a role there. Your visceral sensory area, when you have a stomach ache, when you have indigestion, or when you have a pain coming from your appendix, or your heart feels a little funny, well, that's your visceral sensory area. You have to be able to perceive what's going on with your internal organs. Next, this one's very interesting, the prefrontal cortex. This is where a lot of your personality comes from, learning, intellect, and those things, personality, learning, intellect, those are really big things that your brain does, and it's not going to be completely narrowed down to one single area. It's kind of an interplay between different parts of the brain. But let's look at personality and the prefrontal cortex. Um, on the front portion of your brain, the frontal lobe, a lot of your personality arises as that, at that point. And if you've taken psychology uh, either in high school or in college, you've probably heard about a man named Phineas Gage. Phineas Gage was alive when the railroads were being built. And at this time, the way that uh, railroad workers would do their job is if there was an area of, of rocky terrain that they needed to get rid of some of those rocks, they would take TNT and pack it down into the rocks. And the way they would do that is they had this large stick called a tamping rod. And they would put this TNT down into some holes in the rocks take the tamping rod and pack it down tightly in the holes. Then they would leave and they would detonate the TNT. Well, Phineas Gage was doing this and as he was packing it down with the tamping rod, there was a spark and his tamping rod entered his face just below one of his eyes and it was propelled through the top of his head. It passed through his brain. Luckily, it did not hit any portion of the brain that's responsible for keeping you alive, but what it did do was it severed the connection from his prefrontal cortex to the rest of his brain. And people that knew him said before this, and he lived through this, he, he lived and he made a recovery. People that knew him before always said that he was this real laid back guy, nice, good to be around, and after the injury, after his prefrontal cortex was severed, well, they said that he would get angry at the drop of a hat, that he was just grumpy and mean. So his personality was completely changed 
because we essentially removed his prefrontal cortex with that tamping rod. Next, the limbic association area or just the limbic system in general. Limbic system is responsible for emotions, memories, your sense of danger. And this is kind of right at the top of your brain stem where it connects to your cerebrum. So far, what we've been talking about is the cerebral cortex. And in this picture over here, that is this darker shaded area we can see is the outer few millimeters of the cerebrum. And that's gray matter. And as we go deeper, we get to what's called white matter. White matter is myelinated. And when we talk about the white matter of the cerebrum, we're going to be talking about fibers that connect different parts of your brain to each other or from your brain to your spine. And these can fall in kind of three different categories. The first are association fibers, which actually we don't see in this picture. So I'm going to draw some in. Association fibers connect different parts of the same hemisphere. So maybe it's going from here down to here or from here over to here. So those would be association fibers. Different parts of your brain within the same hemisphere that are communicating with each other. Commissural fibers are when the left and the right hemispheres kind of communicate with each other. And that's what these areas right here are. Commissural fibers, the left and the right hemisphere communicate with each other. And lastly, projection fibers are when the upper part of the brain is in communication with a lower part of the brain, or when the brain is in communication with the spinal cord. So upper and lower brain or brain and spine communicating. Looking inside the brain, the brain is not completely solid. There are actually some hollow portions inside the brain called the ventricles. Well, the ventricles of the brain, which is what we see here kind of as this light blue color, the, the ventricles of the brain are filled with this liquid called cerebrospinal fluid or CSF. The CSF is kind of similar to plasma of the blood, and it's actually made from plasma of the blood by the ependymal cells. Remember the ependymal cells from chapter 11, the self-study portion, those cells make cerebrospinal fluid, and they're actually making it from blood. And the cerebrospinal fluid, as it's made, it will kind of circulate through these ventricles, these hollow portions of the brain, and it goes down through, actually from the brain, down through that central canal of the spinal cord that we saw in lab. When it gets to the base of the spinal cord, it actually comes back up, circulates around the outside of the brain, and eventually back to the ventricles where it's reabsorbed into the blood as new CSF is made. So we're constantly making new CSF, rinsing the brain off with it, and then getting rid of that old CSF. So it cleanses the brain and the spine. And in addition to that, the brain, I don't know if you've ever felt a preserved brain. Uh, in lab, we felt the sheep's brain, which is preserved. Well, it's very firm, rubbery, but that's actually not what a brain feels like in a living state. The brain is very, very soft, very mushy, and it's kind of heavy. The brain weighs somewhere around three pounds, typically, and it would collapse 
under its own weight if it were completely solid because it's so soft. Well, by having these hollow portions of the brain filled with liquid, it actually gives a little bit of firmness, a little bit of outward pressure to the brain. So imagine if you had a balloon that was partially filled with water or a balloon that was really filled with water. Well, the one that's really filled with water is firmer than the one that's only partially filled with water. And that's part of what this cushioning aspect of the cerebrospinal fluid does. It gives support to the brain so that the brain doesn't collapse under its own weight. And additionally, the cerebrospinal fluid on the outside acts as a cushion against impact. So if you got a blow to the head, less damage will occur because that cerebrospinal fluid can act as a little bit of a cushion. Now, one of the things that I want to talk about that can go wrong with the CSF um, is if, if this path was blocked, if we somehow impeded the ability of this cerebrospinal fluid to flow around the brain and spine, well, up here, it's still going to be made, but if it never gets back so that it can be reabsorbed, what we end up with is kind of a traffic jam. More and more and more cerebrospinal fluid is made, even though it's not being reabsorbed. So that cerebrospinal fluid builds up around the spine and more importantly, builds up around the brain. And that causes something called hydrocephaly. And if you've ever seen a baby with hydrocephaly, it can be really, really sad. The baby's head can really enlarge because what's happening is we're filling the baby's head up with this liquid. And since the skull is still mostly cartilage and we still have those soft spots, the head will enlarge because of all of that pressure. And it's really sad but it's actually even more dangerous in an adult if this happens. In an adult, if this happens, since we don't have so much cartilage, since we don't have those soft spots and our skull has solidified, the problem that we run into there is the skull can't expand as more CSF builds up. Instead, what we run into is the brain gets compacted. We're squeezing the brain under all this pressure. So it's a lot more dangerous in an adult than in a child. What they'll typically do is they will cut a hole in the skull and drain the CSF off in that case. And if you've never seen anyone with hydrocephaly, in your textbook on page 467, it shows a baby with hydrocephaly with the really enlarged cranium. The next area I want to talk about is the thalamus. The thalamus uh, is often called the relay station of the brain, and that's because as all of this information is coming into the brain from your spinal cord, there's lots of different locations that it needs to get to depending on exactly what sort of information it is. And the thalamus directs all of this incoming information to the right portion of the brain and information leaving the brain could be going to various different parts of the body. The thalamus directs that also. So anything coming into or exiting the brain passes through the thalamus, which directs it to the proper location. Just below the thalamus is the hypothalamus. Now the hypothalamus is a huge topic in Bio 139 and it plays a role in just about everything in your body. The hypothalamus is your master control gland for your endocrine system. If you've taken a class that touched on anatomy and physiology before, uh, especially in high school, you probably learned the pituitary gland as the master gland. And we'll see why they called it that in just a moment, but we'll also talk about why the hypothalamus really is the one that deserves that title. The hypothalamus, among other things, it controls your autonomic nervous system. Remember from chapter 11, the autonomic nervous system 
is what's in control of all of that stuff that runs in the background that keeps you alive. Things like your breathing rate, your heart rate, uh, whether or not you're in your fight or flight mode versus your rest and digest mode. That autonomic nervous system is controlled by your hypothalamus. Hypothalamus also plays a role in your emotional responses. How do you respond emotionally to a situation? It controls your body temperature uh, because your thermostat, your body's thermostat, is in your hypothalamus. When you get too cold, when you get too hot, your hypothalamus readjusts to cool you down or heat you up. It controls your eating habits. When are you hungry? When are you full? When do you want to eat? When do you not want to eat? Your water balance. This is really important in that thirst is not just something that you feel like, oh, I want to go get a drink. It is very important for letting you know when there is not enough water in your body. And your hypothalamus plays a role in that. Um, in 139, we're going to talk about a hormone called ADH, the antidiuretic hormone. This plays a role in blood pressure maintenance, urination, thirst. So all of that plays a role with water balance, which ties directly in to your hypothalamus. Your sleep-wake cycle is moderated by your hypothalamus and some other parts of your brain. And like I said, your hypothalamus is your master endocrine gland. So let's talk about the pituitary gland and why sometimes it's actually called the master endocrine gland and why it doesn't really need to be called that. So your pituitary gland is right beneath your hypothalamus and it hangs by this little stalk called the infundibulum. So the hypothalamus has the infundibulum coming off of it and the pituitary gland is at the other end of the infundibulum. The pituitary gland controls your other endocrine glands, almost all of them. It tells them when to turn on, when to turn off, when to release certain hormones, when to not release certain hormones. So your pituitary gland is controlling your other endocrine glands. That's why it's often called the master endocrine gland. But the hypothalamus controls the pituitary gland. So even though the pituitary gland is controlling all of these other glands, it's under the control of the hypothalamus. So it's really better to call the hypothalamus the master endocrine gland. In the lab, when we were looking at the model brain, we saw something called the corpora quadrigemina, and it had a really intimidating sounding name. It said something like superior colliculus of the corpora quadrigemina and inferior colliculus of the corpora quadrigemina. And I know that that can sound really scary, but it shouldn't. Let's, let's break that down and see what does that really mean. Corpora quadrigemina really just translates to quadruplets. Quadruplets, kind of like twins, but there's four of them instead of two. So those four things are, there is a left and right superior colliculus, and there's a left and right inferior colliculus. So together there's these four little things that together make the corpora quadrigemina. So what is the superior and inferior colliculus? The superior colliculus is your visual reflex. Let's say you're walking by the park and out of the side of your eye you see a baseball flying at you and you kind of instinctually jump out of the way. That was your superior colliculus that helped do that. Your inferior colliculus is your auditory reflex. Now you step out into the street and all of a sudden a car horn honks at you and you jump back out of the way. That was your inferior colliculus at work. 
Now let's move down a little further away from the cerebrum. Now we're going to look at the medulla oblongata. A lot of times we will just hear it called the medulla. Next semester in 139, we're going to see that that's kind of a misnomer. The medulla is not a thing by itself. Medulla just means the middle of an organ. The medulla oblongata is a part of your brain. We will see next semester other organs have a medulla also. So we need to be specific and say medulla oblongata. This is another one of those things that we're going to talk about a lot in Bio 139. Medulla oblongata controls things that keep you alive without you thinking about it. So there are cardiac control centers there. Speed your heart up, slow your heart down. There's respiratory centers that cause you to inhale, cause you to exhale, cause you to breathe faster or slower. There's vomiting centers when you have eaten something and it's not settling well with you and you need to get it out of your body. You vomit. That's your medulla oblongata. When you sneeze or cough, these are both ways to get rid of something that you've inhaled and you need to get rid of. That's your medulla oblongata. And lastly, hiccuping. When you hiccup, that's your medulla oblongata. So these are body functions that occur without you thinking about them. Now, just beneath your cerebrum is a smaller thing that kind of looks like a, a piece of cauliflower or something. This is your cerebellum, and it is also divided in half. So there is a left and a right cerebellar hemisphere, just like there was a left and a right cerebral hemisphere. The cerebellum is kind of halfway between your, cere uh, your cerebrum and your medulla oblongata. The cerebellum is things that you're not thinking about doing, but it's still kind of voluntary. For example, coordination or muscle memory. Let's say you're walking down the hall. Well, that is a voluntary action, but you are not thinking, move my left leg, move my right leg, move my left leg, move my right leg. It's happening without you really thinking about it because your cerebellum is responsible for that. Coming back to playing instruments, if you play the piano or if you play the trumpet or something, those are voluntary activities. But if you're really good at it and you're not really, really learning it, once you're good at playing the piano, once you're good at playing the trumpet, you're kind of doing it almost subconsciously. Sometimes that's called muscle memory. Also, this is what happens when you're typing. If you type really well, you're not thinking about move my finger to this key. Now move my finger to this key. It happens really without you thinking about it. So instruments and typing, that's also your cerebellum. Voluntary activities that you're not really, really thinking about doing. Obviously, there's not a lot inside the body that is more important than your brain. Your brain is responsible for, in some way, every aspect of what goes on inside your body. And your body will go to great lengths to protect your brain. Unfortunately, there's kind of a drawback that occurs here. Your, your brain needs a lot of oxygen. So there has to be a heavy blood supply to your brain. But there are things in your blood that can be really, really damaging to your brain. So what we end up with is something called the blood-brain barrier, or the BBB. Now the blood-brain barrier says we've got this huge supply of blood vessels running to the brain. That's what we see in this picture here but we need to protect the brain from the stuff that's in that blood. So unlike most of your body, your brain really, really prevents stuff from the blood from getting into the brain. We have these small, small blood vessels, the capillaries, but those capillaries are then wrapped 
by various different types of cells, and there are lots of tight junctions. So what we end up with is the majority of substances in your blood cannot and do not make it out of the bloodstream into your brain. This is a protective mechanism. Very few things in your blood can make it into your brain. The drawback of that is if there's, say, an infection in your brain, well, we have to be able to get medicines from your blood into your brain. And that's really, really difficult because what is it that can make it from the blood into your brain? Well, small compounds or uncharged particles. Unfortunately, most medicines are really large or they have charges. So by protecting itself, the brain also limits our ability to help it when it needs that. That's why it's so incredibly difficult to have medicines that actually work on the brain and to treat brain infections. All right, so that brings us to the end of chapter 12 and our look at the brain uh, specifically from the central nervous system. We will have one more lecture after this. It's two chapters combined, but again, just like this chapter, it's going to only be a very small bit of those chapters. So I will see you in the next lecture, which will be the final lecture for our semester.